Uh, thanks to Jordan and thanks to Big Medium um, for putting on these events. Um, and <laughs> oh, there's a lot of people here. What's up? Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna be sitting down, which is I don't know, maybe kind of weird, but you, I guess y'all can see me. Um, so I, my name's David, um, and we're gonna talk about grant stuff tonight. Uh, thanks all for introducing yourselves. Um, some of what I'm talking about is going to be relevant to everyone, some will be relevant to a few people, some things will be relevant to the other few people, so uh, I'll give you kind of an overview of what's going to go on so you can tune in and out and play Bejeweled or whatever, you know, the parts that don't affect you, so. Uh. Okay, so this is me, um, I am the, uh, I do the grant at the Paramount Stateside Theaters downtown. Um, have you all been to the Paramount? Yeah, maybe, mostly. Um, we do lots of, uh, we have a big summer classic film series, show 100 movies over the summer. Um, we do concerts and comedy and talks and drag shows and burlesque and stuff all year round. It's a um, 100 year old theater. Started as a vaudeville house back in 1915. Um, kind of carried that tradition forward into the present, doing a lot of uh, different variety of uh, types of events. Um, and then the state side is next door. It's kind of like our smaller house where there's more experimental stuff, uh, stranger movies. Um, I am the associate director of sponsored projects at Collab Projects, which is an artist-run gallery here in town. Um, and we'll talk about sponsored projects uh, here in a little bit because I think that will pertain to a lot of you. Um, I am one of the folks that are in Type Real Film Club, along with Tanner back there and our friend Jenny. Um, we do uh, like film screenings and video zines and we make things and do installations and all sorts of weird stuff. And then I do independent grant contracting for folks as well. Um, and the reason I'm talking about all of these things is because this um, kind of informs the way that I look at grants and, and the types of grants that I look for and the way that I approach uh, like thinking about what goes into grants. So th there's, uh, I mean, there's like a whole range of different types of ways that you can approach this. And so this is just some context so you can know me a little bit and where I'm coming from. So uh, here is our overview of this uh, grants talk. Um, so first we'll talk a little about, about where they come from, where the money comes from, um, and then who can get them, uh, what's inside a grant application, how to find them, and when to apply. And <laughs> I don't <laughs> So please feel free to pipe in with any questions that you have at any point. Uh, I haven't given a presentation on anything in like six years, so I uh, would love to have some back and forth with anyone who has anything to say. Okay, so there's kind of four, uh, so um, just to give you an idea of the pacing of this, I'm going to kind of blaze pretty quickly through these first couple of categories. Because um, I think that the last three-ish categories are going to be the most applicable to the most folks in here. So, if, again, so if you want me to slow down or like go over anything in particular a little bit more, just let me know. Just wave at me. Okay, so grants come from generally these four sources. Uh, corporate foundations, family and community foundations, government entities, and other uh, types of entities. So when you are looking for grants from corporate foundations or giving programs, um, these are some of the ways that you can search for those things. Um, they use language like uh, corporate giving, community giving, corporate responsibility. Uh, sometimes a company will have a foundation. A lot of these companies have a mandate to give away a certain percentage of their pre or post tax profit. Um, and then, so these are a couple of examples of Austin-based companies that have giving programs. Um, there's some good lists of these around. Uh, if you just search for like corporate giving lists, you can find uh, some places 
where people have compiled lists of all the folks in Austin and in Texas that have giving programs. Um, and then each of these will have kind of their own focuses around if they give to arts or education or uh, like Whole Foods, of course, gives to some like healthy eating and activities uh, initiatives. Um, applied Materials gives to lots of uh, STEM programs and STEM education programs and STEM arts, uh, STEAM, like STEAM programs. Uh, so Family and Community Foundations is another place that you can find grants. These are all some Austin-based organizations. You may recognize some of these names. Uh, the Long Foundation is one of the major donors for the Long Center. Um, Topher Family Foundation, I think, uh, has a theater at Zach. Um, so these are families in town that have, uh, you know, kind of consolidated their wealth into a foundation, uh, which is both a philanthropic activity and a tax haven, uh, so, you know, you can kind of take your pros and cons of these things. Uh, and then, so these, so if you look at the, the, the Long Foundation picture over here, I think I picked it up. This is kind of the way that a lot of these websites are laid out. Um, they'll have like history, mission and goals, guidelines for uh, what you need to do to apply for a grant, board and staff. Um, and then, so there's the Austin Community Foundation and lots of towns around Texas. There's probably, I'd say 15 to 20 community foundations around Texas and these are based in cities or based in areas. Um, and a lot of them will fund um, arts or education or uh, various social services programs. Um, I want to do a quick poll real quick just to, again, like, see the room. Um, who, who here, who is here tonight um, looking to write grants for a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization. Okay, uh, who is looking to write grants for themselves as a fiscally sponsored individual or group? And if you don't know what that means yet, we'll talk about that later. Okay, and who's looking to write grants just for yourself as like a free agent? Okay, so kind of all of those things. <laughs> all right, that's, that's good. So this is gonna be, like I said, this is gonna be kind of broad. Some of the things will apply to you somewhat. Um, so tune in and out as you will. Um, okay, so uh, government entities are the third major place where grants will come from. Um, the City of Austin grants we'll talk about in a lot more detail later because those are some of the ones that apply the most to the folks in here. Are there are there people here that aren't based in Austin currently? A few, but most most of y'all are based in Austin. Okay. So the well, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Okay. So the Texas Commission on the Arts is um, Texas is. Uh, arts organization, and it's kind of a pass-through for National Endowment for the Arts funds. National Endowment for the Arts is the federal arts group, and they give out big grants to lots of folks. Um, these all come out of various taxes. Um, I put Austin Public Health in here. Um, at the, so my main grant thing at the Paramount, um, we got a grant four years ago for about $60,000 a year for five years for a uh, an arts-based education program that we do in schools uh, here in Austin. And so this is kind of a, a nod towards being resourceful and kind of creative about the way that you frame your projects when you are um, looking for entities to fund various things. And then there's other uh, miscellaneous organizations um, that aren't any of the above. Um, so there's foundations that are um, kind of legacies for famous artists or famous philanthropists or other folks that they may be somewhat directly involved in but that are more kind of set up in their honor, like the Andy Warhol Foundation. 
Um, there are giving circles like Impact Austin, which is a group here that gives out about six $100,000 grants every year, and it's a group of several hundred women in Austin that want to have um, kind of a very hands-on uh, touch with, with local nonprofits, and so they all pay into a big pot, and then collectively they vote on giving those grants out every year. And then there's groups like uh, Preservation Austin that gets funds from other folks and then we'll distribute those funds for various preservation projects around. Uh, any questions in this section before we move on to the next thing? What is the name of the one in the purple in the center at the bottom? What name is that? Oh, so that's oh. that's the the Andy Warhol Foundation. Oh. That's like oh. a picture of the oh. one of the screens there. So these are generally the buckets of folks that can get grants. So the by far the largest group of people that can get grants and generally the biggest grants and from the most sources are uh, 501c3 nonprofit groups. So um, like Big Medium is a nonprofit, the Paramount Theater is a nonprofit, um, Collab Projects is a nonprofit, the Long Center. Uh, most, most arts groups generally, um, if it's not you know, like Alamo Draft House. A lot of arts groups are nonprofits, um, and then fiscally sponsored sponsored groups and individuals um, are eligible for some grants. Individuals sometimes, and then occasionally a few other folks. Um, occasionally, uh, LLCs or for-profit companies can get grants from. Uh, there's there's a couple of city programs that ran this year. Did any of y'all apply for the CSAP grants? So there, this year there was a, the city ran a program that was for spaces that um, were in danger of losing their place because of rent hikes or because of uh, you know increases of costs of various types. And the city was running those for 501c3 groups and for um, some of the for-profit music venues downtown. Um, does anyone do preservation grants in this room? Yeah, we'll talk about fiscally sponsored groups in just a second. What is a preservation grant? Oh, preservation, uh, like historic preservation grants for, so like for the Paramount Theater, we work a lot on the preservation of the building itself. So bricks and mortar, like repairing the building. Um, okay, so to quickly go through these. So 501c3 groups um, are groups that are recognized by the federal IRS, uh, and you don't have to pay taxes, and um, you have to have a board, and uh, some other various restrictions. Um, these groups are eligible for the largest grants, like all of these grants um, over here on the right side were grants that were given out to organizations here in Austin from National Endowment for the Arts uh, in their spring cycle. So you can see some of these larger grants um, to support larger projects at these nonprofits. Okay, so a lot of you said that you are looking for grants as a fiscally sponsored individual or group. Uh, are any of you interested in that but don't know what it means right now? <laughs> okay, great. So this is one of, I think this is one of like the secrets that you're going to get today if you don't know this already. Um, so what fiscal sponsorship means is if you are uh, an individual artist or if you are a group um, that doesn't that hasn't gone through the process to apply for like an LLC or your 501c3 or any of these kind of um, extensive like 
designations with the IRS or with some other entity, um, then you can work with a fiscal sponsor who uh, is an organization that is a 501c3, and this will allow you to be eligible for grants and for do donations. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that I work on, um, I'm the director of the sponsored projects for CoLab Projects, who is an artist-run uh, gallery and um, kind of artist resources collective here in town. Um, so these are, these over here on, what's that, on the left, uh, these were all the groups that we uh, served as a fiscal sponsor for during the city's 2018-2019 uh, fiscal year. So let's use um, Glowed Up, for example. So uh, our friend Anita has a project which is um, a, a mini ball competition. Um, she is an individual, she doesn't have a 501c3 designation, so she comes to me as the director of the sponsored projects for CoLab projects and says, um, I have this, uh, this project that is, uh, you know, like an arts project uh, that I want to do here in Austin that is going to be open to the public. It's going to bring in these people. It's going to have these elements. Um, I'm looking to secure some grant funding to make this project happen. So when she comes to us, then we, so she applies, she wants to apply for a, a city grant. So we go in and open up an application for her. And um, once we open up the application for her, then she uh, you know, fills in all the grant information and she submits. Uh, and because CoLab is, uh, has, like, checks all of these boxes, it's um, a 501c3 organization designated with the IRS. Uh, it has a budget of over $50,000 a year, it has a salaried executive director, it's been around for more than three years. Um, it can serve as a fiscal sponsor, meaning that it can get funds from the city and pass those funds on to this project. Um, and that's a requirement for, um, like for their reporting, and then you don't have to put it on your taxes because this organization is, serves as a pass-through for you to get these funds. Um, a lot of uh, like foundations and government entities require a fiscal sponsor because they can't give money directly to an individual based on all of their own reporting uh, requirements. Yeah. So there's a number of different ways that these relationships can be set up. The way that we do it is we have kind of an informal uh, memorandum of understanding between CoLab and the sponsored project. So CoLab in this case is the fiscal sponsor and Glowed Up is the sponsored project. So we have an, um, so we have an understanding between us and kind of the way that this relationship works is the fiscal sponsor, um, in our case, we take 10% um, of whatever the grant award is um, for administrative costs and so that we can provide insurance, which is a requirement of the grant, and so that we can um, manage the payments coming from the city and going out to the artists. So we, um, provide help writing the grants and creating the budget and all of these things. Um, and then the project gets the benefit of basically having like a 501c3 umbrella extended over them so they can receive the funds. Yes. Correct. Only if you have a fiscal sponsor. Can you say one more time? Please. <laughs> so if you are one of these projects and you have a fiscal sponsor, then the fiscal sponsor is responsible for reporting this money to the IRS on their uh, like on their yearly tax return. 
So, take care. So, Global doesn't have to mention a thing. Um, so, other questions around this. Like I said, I think this this thing of being fiscally sponsored is kind of one of the like one of the secrets. I mean, not for those of you who already know it, but it's not that commonly known. I don't think. Um, so, other questions around this particular thing. Yeah, great question. So Collab Projects is one, that's the one that I work with here in town. Um, Big Medium has a good fiscal sponsorship program. Um, Rude Mex is a group here in town that does fiscal sponsorship for kind of experimental theater uh, groups. Uh, Museum of Human Achievement right over here has a really good program, Women and Their Work. I think there's probably a list on the city website that lists all of them. Um, and then each of these groups will have kind of a, uh, a focus, depending on what their mission is and depending on who the person is that's running the program. Um, so a lot of, and folks will have slightly different uh, fee rates and insurance policies. So you can shop around and see what you like best. Under what circumstances would you have to cut someone off <laughs> yeah, so the question was, when would you have to cut someone off as a sponsored project? Um, I, I haven't had to deal with this yet, but the circumstances in which I would choose to not continue working with someone, um, so these, so when you get a grant, award, you essentially enter into a contract with the city or with whoever the funding entity is saying, um, I'm going to perform this service or I'm going to create this product and in exchange, I will receive this money from you. Um, so if, if one of these projects um, were to get a grant and then disappear and not do the project, uh, then it would be pretty harmful for both that project and for the fiscal sponsor. Um, because the fiscal sponsor does have a degree of responsibility to ensure that the sponsored project carries through with whatever they said they're going to do. So as long as the sponsored project uh, turns their stuff in on time, does the project, fills in the report in the end, then that is a pretty good sponsor project relationship. So as an artist looking for grants, um, would having fiscal sponsor sponsorship then make uh, me or an artist eligible for grants with the description that they only grant to nonprofits? Or will they say individuals with sponsorship? Most grants, if they allow for fiscally sponsored individuals to apply, they'll say that somewhere on their website or in their request for proposals. Do you see this kind of set up with agencies outside of the city? Occasionally. It's, so like I said, the most common, most grants are um, for 501c3 groups, but there's, there's a good number that allow you to apply with a fiscal sponsor, and then some, like the like family foundations, there's a lot of flexibility there sometimes, depending on who's on staff, uh, if you can find a connection. There's, there's flexibility because the people that are running the foundation are making those decisions, um, sometimes on a one, on a case by case basis. Um, so in a lot of those situations, it's something where you can start a conversation with the staff at a foundation to see if that's a possibility. Um, but not always. If a, if a person has an LLC or sponsor, that they're not eligible, right? Is it, is it? Okay, so the question is, if you have an LLC, are you eligible for grants? And 
Uh, my answer to that would be maybe. Um, I, I guess I won't say which one of these folks, but there's at least one of these folks on this list that is an LLC. Um, and sometimes if you just don't mention it, then they're not going to ask. Okay. So maybe you could use your individual name instead of your company name? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's creative ways to uh, market yourself. What about if you like registered as uh, one of those women, uh, a woman-owned business? Is there a connection with that? Uh, the question, if you're registered as a women-owned business, uh, I haven't seen anything specifically around that, but probably. So I wonder, is there a, um, a season for writing and accepting grants, like, or is it, a, is it just a year-round process? Or is it like grants usually done by September and then they're funded? Uh, the question, when yeah. is it year-round? Uh, yes, whenever. whenever. It just depends on the grant you're applying for. I have, I have my own personal grants calendar in one of these slides that you'll see in a little bit. So it's, it's chaos, but it'll kind of show you the process of all that. So if you apply to one of these um, fiscal sponsors and then apply again the next year, so you want to do a different project, um, how does that affect? your standing regarding other maybe newer artists or artists that are um, you know, haven't received the money. So the fiscal sponsor won't be making grants. The fiscal sponsor so the fiscal sponsor works with a sponsored project so the project can apply for grants. Um, so is, is there like for instance if you've got uh, an idea for a big project. Is it better to hold off and apply for grants when you have the big project all ready to go, or do some smaller ones and start to build a reputation, for instance, where you took a certain grant and performed, and then the next year you took a smaller grant and performed? I mean, are you building sort of a uh, a fiscal responsibility as an artist to do project after project. I don't, I don't know if I'm being clear, but. I think, I think that just depends on the strategic plan uh, for yourself or for your organization. Um, this is one of the things we'll talk about towards the end is um, uh, pursuing the grants that you need in order to accomplish your mission, whatever that is. Um, so that's kind of up to you and what you want your pacing and scaling to be. Uh, other questions around? Yeah. Yes, so for the city grant specifically, you have to have um, general, general liability insurance up to a certain limit. Um, I'm not sure how these other uh, sponsors do it, but for CoLab, um, we, <laughs> this was a hell of a process, but we found a group out of Missouri or somewhere that has, uh, that will provide insurance for, for sponsored projects. And so we, basically we've done the work to find this group and build a relationship with them so that when we take on a new sponsored project, we can just send an email to this group, they already know us, they know what we do, um, and we can secure a new certificate of insurance for the sponsored project. Um, and that, so like I said, that certificate of insurance is a requirement for, for the city grants. Um, so that's, yeah, it's just a part of the, the sponsor and sponsored project relationship that will have to be negotiated with whoever your fiscal sponsor is. Uh, the question is, who would own whatever is produced? Um, this again is something that is will be different for different folks. Uh, for CoLab, 
we don't have any ownership. It's just it's a handshake memo um, where we serve as a pass through for the funds. We help write the grant, and then you own whatever you produce. Um, some larger groups, uh, some national groups like uh, Fractured Atlas, if you know those folks, they have different rules around that. And there's some like ownership things that you have to navigate, but that's that's something that you just talk to, uh, or you talk about with whoever you're working with. Sorry. Uh, the question, are there any grant periodicals, sort of, we'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, things to look for or to run away from, I think. The thing that I would stay away from is uh, anything that is that is too like legalese or anything around ownership. Um, this, that's the main thing. It's in, in the way that in the way that co-op does it. It's a pretty simple exchange. Um, there's the the fee that comes out of the award. You don't have to pay anything up front. There's no um, annual membership fee. It's just uh, so like if you get if you get three thousand dollars in, then we would hold three hundred dollars from that check, and you'd get the rest. Um, there's other there's other entities that will charge um, like a yearly membership fee. Um, you know the things around ownership. Um, I, I would stay away from those things. So for some of these. Um 501c pass-throughs. Is there much in the way of getting funds for, like these are mainly shows and projects. Are there things that are also for equipment or for uh, building fees or something like that? So those would be different grants. Um, this, this list here, these are, you're right, these are all projects and public events and that's because these are all grants that were received through the city's community initiatives program, which is directly geared towards uh, projects and events. Um, but if you found a different grant that was for equipment or for uh, you know membership fees for various things, then that would be fine as well. It just depends on what the what the grant is. How about research grants? Research. Mm -hmm. Research grants. Yeah. Uh, research grants, yes. If you found a research grant that allowed you to have a fiscal sponsor, then that would be that would be fine. Great question. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question, what do fiscal sponsors look for when they are looking for people to partner with? Um, that will vary from, from group to group. Uh, with CoLab, we look for people that generally align with the mission of presenting contemporary art things in its various forms. Um, since I run the program, I look for people that I want to work with, um, and people that I think are going to be responsible and do the things they say they're going to do. Um, there are some groups will have a much more extensive application process. Um, some groups will only take on uh, projects that are, are going to be bringing in a certain amount every year, so that the like time to money ratio equals a certain thing. Um, but yeah, each each of these groups listed here um, has kind of their own metrics for deciding who they want to work with. Uh, so, just case by case. This, I, this process, the fiscal sponsorship process is, um, is really loose. 
there aren't there aren't a lot of guidelines around this. Um, I've read several books on this, and there aren't. This isn't even really in, like a very official designation with the IRS or anyone. Um, this is kind of it just works out this way, and um, there aren't uh, there aren't like rules on how it has to happen. Um, so often it's you know the organization that does it will have some rules. Um, and you can kind of shop around to see what fits your work best. All right, well, we can come back to this later. Um, so be thinking on any more questions you have on this. And then, uh, so our fourth, third, third group of folks that can get grants is individuals. Um, when we get to this point, I recommend that you start thinking more um, in terms of awards and fellowships rather than grants often. Um, grants, at least in, uh, like in the arts world, grants are often more geared towards organizations or groups. Um, and then if you're looking for something just for your own work, um, there's residencies, fellowships, awards. Uh, there's the Tito's Award that Big Medium helps administer here. Um, and this uh, is uh, in the Facebook event, uh, the link to that. There's tons of great stuff there. We recommend looking through that. Um, lots of colleges will run residencies and fellowships, lots of foundations, um, all sorts of books. The Excel sheet that you posted, is that what you're talking about? Or is it a separate one? Separate. There's, yeah, so in the, in the Facebook event, I posted, um, and we'll, I think we'll send this out by email as well for anyone who doesn't have Facebook. Um, oh, Facebook is terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so in, in that event, and you'll get this by email, there's, I've compiled a list of it's some arbitrary number, I think it was 107 of the largest foundations that fund the arts in Texas. Um, a lot of those groups have extensive websites with their guidelines and people that you can get in touch with. Um, so it's a good, there's probably some things there that you could apply for, and it's also just a good overview of who's funding what um, and like what types of projects are getting attention and funding. Um, and then this, this link is there as well to all of these um, artist opportunities that are more geared towards uh, individuals. Yes? My fiscally sponsored program is actually an arts business boutique. So Yeah, so you're just asking about like where to find that type of funding? Yeah, we'll talk some about where to like where and how to find some of those grants in a little bit. That I mean, that is the key to the whole game. So Um, it's, it's just, it's semantic sometimes. Um, I see language about grants much more often for 501c3s and for projects put on by groups and awards more for individuals, but, but different groups will use those words differently. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about 
what is inside of these grant applications. Um, so for these narrative and, uh, so the three main components of a grant application are gonna be your narrative, your budget, and then the attachments. Um, and I'll go through each of these a little bit. For these, I'm using um, examples of grants that I've written for uh, for the Paramount Theater and for Hyper Real Film Club, our film thing that I was talking about. Um, and I'll tell you which each one is. Uh, okay, so we'll start with talking a little bit about the narrative. So, in looking over the grants um, that I've worked on, and more importantly, I think, uh, for those of you, there's a couple folks here who are asking about um, grant experience, like to get grant experience for a job or so that you can write better grants. Um, the, the best secret I've found there is to get on grant review panels, um, meaning uh, so there's various places that you can do this. You can apply to the city of Austin. Um, you can apply to Texas Commission on the Arts. Um, a couple times a year, these organizations um, will either put out a call or have available on their website an application form where you can submit your information and apply to be on the panel that reviews the grants that are coming in uh, to get funding from that source. Um, so I uh, got to be on a panel for cultural arts funding for the core cycle a couple years ago for theater groups. So I got to read 30 grant applications from groups all around the city that were doing all sorts of different types of theater projects. Um, and that is one of the things that uh, really allows you to see like, what works and what doesn't um, in these applications. And then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, about a month ago, I was on a, a federal grant panel for USDA local food promotion programs. And I don't know anything about that, but neither did either of the other folks on the panel that I worked with. So, both as an encouragement to you to uh, apply to be on these panels if you are interested in learning more about the ways that folks write grants. And also a, uh, I guess a kind of cautionary tale about who might be on your panel uh, when you're applying for grants. Um, it might be someone who doesn't know a goddamn thing about uh, what you're applying for. And so that really leads to all of these things. Um, the key, I think, to writing good grant narrative is um, very clear, persuasive writing. So clarity, brevity, accuracy, defined goals, concrete details, and then this last one is really big, evidence that you can do what you say you're going to do and that you are the right person or team to do it. Um, okay, so this is... Rule number one of shitty PowerPoints is don't put this many words on one, but uh, I, have, I have three of these and I'm just going to give you a minute to read through this. Um, so this is, uh, this is from one of the grants I wrote for the Paramount. Um, this one has not come in yet, but hopefully it's going to be around $200,000 if we're lucky. Um, so this is, this is an example of clarity and brevity. So. Uh, take a minute to read through this and um, try and think about um, uh, the way that as much information as possible is packed into as few words as possible. You wrote this? 
You must have wrote a really good book before some kids. Okay, so as an example of clarity and brevity, um, this is uh, three paragraphs that packs in as much information as possible into as few words as possible. Um, so the first paragraph is the mission statement. This is what the Paramount does overall. The second paragraph um, really quickly goes through, kind of gives you the like historic flavor of what this place is, why it's important. Um, quickly, uh, says when it's founded, how many people come every year, name drops a lot of things that folks know, um, says that uh, the Austin Theater Alliance manages these two things, so it gives you kind of a quick idea of the financial and management structure of the whole shebang. Um, and then the final paragraph really quickly goes through, um, so this is what Paramount Education does, here's the number of students, um, uh, here's like where we've been, here's where we're going, here's where we're going to be in the future, um, and then ties it all together by saying uh, we, we, the Paramount, is, uh, are like the right people to do this because we have this historic space and we have this network of folks that are uh, kind of tied into this programming. So just clear, punchy, brief, um, not flowery, um, just gives you a very clear idea of like the overall scope of what's happening. Once you have uh, this kind of thing set up, it's like a cover letter basically for the place and what you're trying to do, how often are you going to pretty much use this over again? All the time. <laughs> Um, I, no, I don't put all of this in a cover letter. In a cover letter, I would list maybe three or four salient points. Um, say, you know, the Paramount is 100 years old, 250,000 folks come, year, come every year. Our education department reaches this many people every year. Um, for a cover letter, you want it to be <laughs> personal. You want to kind of cozy up to whoever it is, be like, I love what you're doing, it's so great. And then here's why we're so great also, and here's like why we can be great together. Um, so yeah, every grant is gonna be a little bit different in the way that it's structured and like where you need to put these different pieces of information. Yes. Are you envisioning a new project for an existing organization or a new project completely like from a blank slate? Um, so a lot of grants have requirements around that you have to be in existence for two to three years before you can apply. Um, a lot of grants will say that you have to have uh, like three 990s on file. The 990 is the uh, tax that you file every year for it for a 501c3. Um, so that being new would preclude you from getting certain grants. Um, for other ones, that's just how you write the narrative. You, uh, you know, sell it as capacity building. Um, you say like, uh, for, those, for some of those, um, you can use your past experience and past experience of your team members to demonstrate that you know what you're doing, and that you have the bona fides to perform X project. Um, yeah, it all depends on, on the thing that you're applying for. Um, okay, so this, uh, so defined goals. This, this is from, um, our core grant for Hyperreal Film Club from a couple years ago, 
Uh, we got awarded $4,000 for that. Um, so one thing that a lot of grants will ask for is uh, goals. Uh, so some sort of metric um, of success or that you are, uh, you know, so what you're going to do with the money. Um, the really important thing here, one of the really important things here is that you formulate your goals in a way that at the end of the project period, you can either say, yes, I accomplished this goal or no, I didn't. Um, so um, let's look at this, this second one. Um, so goal, provide a showcase or platform for 64 local filmmakers to present their work to a large, excited audience. Um, at the end of our project period, we can either say, yes, we worked with 64 artists or no, we worked with 50 artists, and here's why we fell short of that goal. Um, if, if that goal said, provide a platform for local filmmakers to present their work, um, then it wouldn't be defined in the same way. We could say yes, no, maybe. Um, grant makers often like to see that you have um, a benchmark that you can accomplish or not within the grant period. So um, this seems like a lot for just a $4,000 grant. Have you ever been giving feedback or do you have any insight on like saying that you're going to do too much and then the grant, the sponsors, the providers, then their feedback being that seems really unrealistic? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, the question was, this seems like a lot for a $4,000 grant and that's true. Um, this when we put together these goals, we were applying for $10,000, um, and then we received $4,000. So often grants will have um, a kind of story arc where you apply for a certain amount with a certain scope of your project, and then you'll get awarded a certain amount, and then you'll have a chance to reduce the scope of your project to meet the amount of funds you've gotten. The city, with the, with the core funding, the city does that. So that's... You need to be kind of ready to like make that adjustment and be flexible. And... Yeah, so the way that we wrote this grant, we had, um, for our core funding program, we had kind of six different uh, programs that we were planning to run if we got the full amount. And then when we got $4,000, um, we uh, like cut, cut off three of those things. So that the it all is like scaled together. So you have a sort of discussion after you receive the money with them to, so that they know why not do that you're scaling back your goal. Yes, for this program, you submit a revised narrative and budget after you get your award amount. Um, and so you have a conversation with whoever the city staff is. Um, to say like, this is now our new scope of work, these are our new goals, um, and so whenever you report on it at the end, you only have to meet the revised budget and goals. Um, okay, so this, this is really important. This is one that I see a lot when I've worked with folks to um, kind of hone and fine tune their grants is uh, to stick to really concrete details. Uh, so again, just take a couple minutes to read through this and think about all of the um, numbers, percentages, uh, places, concrete things that you see. So this, um, this little grant portion has, uh, if you can keep in mind all of these things that we've talked about so far, clarity, brevity, 
um, concrete details, um, defined goals. Uh, so we talk about um, you know what we do to pay other folks, um, the amount of money that we generate for the organization and for other businesses around the organization. Um, the 300 nights at hotels, and of course this is for the Paramount as a really huge arts institution, these numbers are large, um, but the important thing is that they are concrete. So if, you know, if you're an organization that brings in 5,000 folks to town every year, um, if you have a way to collect metrics on hotel stays, um, or you know, like where folks are coming in from, like whatever those numbers are, scaled to your operations are going to be really critical um, information for a grand panel to be able to see. This is so helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm curious if you have advice because I feel like a lot of folks in this room are representing themselves or like extremely tiny organizations that are not going to be able to touch these kind of concrete numbers that may struggle to collect the metrics. Do you have any suggestions for very, very, very tiny organizations that are trying to get those concrete details and like sell themselves, but maybe like we get like 30 folks at our events sometimes? They want a hamburger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that, that kind of thing. Yeah. For sure. So, can we use Chicago Street Poets as an example? Great. So, for a group like Chicago Street Poets, who has um, monthly-ish events, 30 folks, 30-ish um, folks attend, maybe five, six, seven poets are presenting their work each time. 20 poets. Um, so, those are all concrete numbers. Um, so, the scale of what you're doing, um, and this is something that I'm talking. I've got this in my notes somewhere, um, but I'll go ahead and talk about this now. So, you know how I was saying that I was on this USDA grant panel. Um, <laughs> when I was reviewing these grants, I was, you know, reading about like uh, walk-in cold storage for for. Uh, you know, farmers across regions and like trucking, uh, trucking passages through New England and like, you know, crop yields for corn or pineapples or like whatever. I guess not pineapples in New England, but uh, yeah. Um, and so I, as the person reviewing this grant, I don't have any uh, like really metrics or benchmarks for what the scale of something like that should be. Um, like I have the information that is in the grant, and it's kind of that way by design. Um, you grant panelists are instructed to judge a grant, the strength of a grant, based on what's inside of it, rather than comparing it to the scale of other projects. And so the only exception to that being if, um, you know, Chicago Street Poets was applying for $50,000 for their 30 person events. But yeah, but if you're, if you're applying for an amount of money that is kind of reasonable to the scale of operations that you are doing, um, then as long as you use concrete details about how many folks are coming, and and people know that, you know, as a small organization, you're not going to have data analytics for, uh, you know, who's shopping in the neighborhood. Um, so these these things are all kind of scaled to the size of your operation. It sounds like a lot of it, like you mentioned before, really is like how creative can you get with the information you have. Yeah, creative, creative and concrete. Um, uh, just if you're a selling artist mm -hmm. and you're charging sales tax, add up your sales tax to you. That's a contribution to the tax. 
Other questions? And here are a few things that you don't want. So, uh, opposite of concrete details are overly general statements that anyone could make. Um, in your grant, you want to be very specific to what you're doing, what you're offering, um, and to talk about why you are the right person to do what you're doing. So, um, for instance, uh, when I'm writing a grant for the Paramount Theater, um, if I'm talking about preservation, like bricks and mortar work, instead of saying um, something kind of lofty and vague, like, it's important to preserve our cultural heritage for future generations, I would say something like, as an example of John Epperson's early architectural work in a proto-atmospheric theater, the Paramount is representative of the vaudeville era in American placemaking, and therefore an important landmark worth preserving. Yeah, so that sort of thing. Um, so you use what you have um, to be unique and um, to stay away from these kind of broad things. Um, to go back to the point of uh, grant panelists are instructed to only use what's inside the grant itself to uh, judge and grade the grant. Um, you don't want to make unsupported statements. Um, meaning claims that you make in the grant, but that you don't support in the grant. Like with the last slide, how it said that the revenue created was from that calculator. Exactly. So if you have, if you have a way to uh, kind of shift the responsibility of those numbers to a trusted source, then that's good. But exactly, if I had said the Paramount makes $10 million a year for other organizations and didn't attribute that somewhere, then that would be unsupported. Um, you don't want to include irrelevant details, uh, meaning things that don't directly support or impact the thing you're applying for. Uh, you don't generally want to use overly flowery language. Um, again, that goes back to the clarity and brevity. Um, you don't want to use unexplained insider language or too many tropes. Uh, so this this is something that kind of only comes clear after you like have been writing grants for a while, or after you've seen the grants that other folks write. But there's certain certain like turns of phrase that everyone uses, and again, you want your language to be unique to you. Um, and I think. Again, so one of the main things that grant panelists are going to be looking for when they're judging, grading your grant um, is not necessarily the, the scale of the project. They're not, they're not always going to um, grade your grant on the scale versus another grant, but, but more that you really know what you're doing um, and that you're the right person to be performing the project that you're presenting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, well, uh, any questions about narrative stuff before we move on to budget? Besides uh, about society, could you give a couple other examples of jokes? Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about this. It's, it's hard to pull them. Um, well, I've got some I can think of right off the top of my head. Yeah. We work hard to support local artists. Oh. Yeah. Uh, we, we do our best to encourage the community to make arts. Um, anything that talks in really general ways that we, uh, you know, we're uh, trying to build a better future for the community's children. Yeah. I feel like uh, tropes and general language go kind of hand in hand, at least for more than them. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, my, <laughs> I think the, the tropiest of tropes is uh, like like Tom's like uh, the uh, e providing X for those in need like that sort of language. It's very general. Um, everyone uses it. Um, so yeah. So to not be general to like come down to your own project. Like here's the unique thing that I'm providing. Here's why I am doing this specific thing. Here's why I'm the one that should be doing it.
Okay, so in so I'm using the city grant as an example. Um, for this grant, there's going to be three components to your budget. Um, there's the financial snapshot, which is kind of the overall uh, reach of your organization. Um, so F FY is uh, fiscal year. The city's fiscal year is from October through September. Um, and so that's how they ask for you to kind of track your money. And what they use this for is to see your kind of financial and fiscal health over time, to see if your organization is growing, if it's stable, if your um, if your expenses are greater than your revenue. That's a red flag. Um, so even even if you're a nonprofit, um, the city and other grant makers still want to see that you are in the black, and that you're making a little bit of money. Um, you can't. Uh, you can't like pay dividends to people. That's one of the nonprofit rules. But you want to have some money in the bank um, in case you know one of your projects goes belly up. Then you have some money to fall back on. Um, who knows what a match is in a grant? Who doesn't know what a match is in a grant? Okay. So uh, really quickly. Um, to use the city again for an example, um, or this this isn't the city, but so if your grant requires a one-to-one -one cash match, say you're awarded ten thousand dollars, you must match that with ten thousand dollars of your own. Um, and the way that they track this is by the financial report you submit at the end of the project. Um, they'll want to see that you spent twenty thousand um, dollars. Where does match money come from? Uh, admissions for your program, merch sales, personal money you put into the project, other grants, Kickstarters. This is this is one of the things that I have generally need to talk a lot about with with my sponsored projects. Is does this does this make sense? Is this kind of iffy? Great question. So the question is, um, can a can a corporate entity or an individual or someone else also donate money to a sponsored project through a fiscal sponsor? The answer is yes. Um, that also is something that you would work out with your fiscal sponsor. So like at Colab, we do the same thing as with the grant awards. We charge 10% of whatever the amount is for admin fees. Um, and then that works as a pass through to you. We report it on our taxes. Um, and that allows, it's attractive to corporate entities and to individuals because then they can um, write it off on their taxes. So if you got like local business to sponsor your event and give food or drink, or whatever, and that could, you could add up a price tag on that, part of the match, make it intangible. Yeah, so that would be, those are in-kind donations instead of cash. Um, and that works a little bit differently. Um, but is so with in-kind donations, there is um, there's the actual cash value of whatever the thing is, and then there's um, kind of a an arbitrary assigned amount on top of that. So that's a little stickier to navigate. But you can also write write that off through a fiscal sponsor. It's just you got to work a little bit more to make that happen. We'll get to that on the next slide. So that will depend on the who's giving you the grant. Um, I don't know, I haven't encountered that issue with any of these city grants through sponsorship, through fiscal sponsorships, so I know there are situations where 
Um, so the way the city does this with, uh, with these community initiatives projects is they'll give you 75% of the award up front and then 25% after you complete your reporting at the end. And so there may be a situation where if you don't, um, if you aren't able to prove allowable expenses up to the amount of your match, they may not give you the remaining 25%. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that, though. No, for, so this, this would be the sponsored project's budget. Yeah. Okay, so here's, um, so take a look at these and think about which ones are or is viable. All right, who wants to answer? Okay, hint, there's only one that doesn't work. C doesn't work, why? So in this scenario, C is the only one that doesn't meet the requirements of a half match, at least half of which must be cash. Um, so I used this example because this is the way the city does their community initiatives grant. Um, so let's say you're gonna get a $2,000 award, you have to match it with $1,000, at least half of that has to be cash, up to half can be in kind. So the cash match, again, is money that you can raise from admissions, from merch sales, from a Kickstarter, from whatever other uh, cash sources you have. And then in-kind can be the, um, like the fair market price of volunteer hours, um, of uh, space that's donated if you don't have to pay for renting your space, um, and a handful of other things. Yes. I haven't encountered that in the grants that I've worked on, but I'm sure that that does happen. The question about the, the payout for grants timeline. The, the city's really good about um, paying uh, kind of at, at points throughout the grant period. Um, but yeah, it just is gonna depend on who the grantor is. Some grants will ask for that. Most most folks will have. Uh, they'll they'll tell you when they're going to give you the money. Um, all right, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. Oh, okay. I need to go over this. So expenses. Um, this is really important. Um, so this is this was our initial budget for our hyperreal grant. Um, just to use as an example. Um, it's really important to fully itemize out all of your expenses. 
Um, so you see this, it looks like a lot, uh, but this is really helpful for a grant panelist to see like all of these dollars are going to exactly this place. The more, the more detail, the more like, like anal specificity you have in these budgets, the more uh, legitimate you're going to come off as. Yes, they have, uh, so the question, allowable expenses, unallowable expenses, the city has a really long set of guidelines where they lay all those things out for you. And most grants, most grants will have that. I mean, an income, same thing. Uh, this is the way the city grant is laid out. Um, admissions, uh, so earned income is money that, um, like individuals are paying you to buy a shirt, to buy a ticket, to buy um, uh, concessions if you're selling stuff. Un unearned income is grants, donations, um, other things like that. And then in kind. Okay, and then, uh, so these are um, common examples of attachments, resumes, samples of work documentation of events, um, so pictures of previous events, um, pictures of posters, pictures of other uh, materials and assets that you've used for previous things, um, any articles you've gotten, any awards you've gotten. Okay, so this, this is the hardest part, honestly, is finding the grants, and uh, I don't have any magic spells for you here, but this is the way that I do it. So, generally the first step is just, as simple as it sounds, just Googling grant lists for whatever your project is. So I had a job recently where I was, where I'm um, grant writing for a documentary. So the first thing I did was just type in like documentary grant lists. And I got some good things that way. Um, so generally there's folks that have compiled some of these things in whatever your field is. Um, and you can get some good like first steps that way. Uh, subscription services are mostly shit. Uh, don't pay for them. Um, the, the, only, the only one that's really any good is Foundation Center, but it's like $1,600 every couple of years. Um, there are, I meant to look this up, I didn't, I'm sorry, but there are a couple of libraries here in town that have all these things paid for on their computers. I'm sure you can find that. Uh, networking, um, if you're, especially if you're working for a 501c3 group, uh, using your board is gonna be one of the best ways to get in, especially with family foundations or corporate sources. Um, as, as with anything, uh, you know, the folks you know is gonna be one of the best ways to get access to things. Um, City of Austin, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'll talk about that now. Uh, okay, so community initiatives. Are y'all familiar with these two programs, sort of-ish? So community initiatives is um, the program that the city runs. Uh, this year they have four deadlines, um, August 26th, so next Monday is the first one. That's for programs that are happening October through December, um, and then it cycles through after that for every three months. Um, the, if you've applied for this before, the guidelines are really different this year, so I would encourage you to look through all the guidelines very carefully. Um, this is for public events uh, that are open to everyone. Um, you can still charge for the events, that doesn't matter, uh, but they need to be uh, like public-facing art events. So they can't be, it can't be like workshops um, for like 20 folks. Um, can't really be for uh, like, like making, for like materials for making a work of art. Um, but if you are gonna put on like a visual art exhibition, it could be for funds for renting a space. 
um, for your insurance, for paying yourself as an artist. Um, questions? Sorry, we're getting close to the end, so I'm kind of rushing a little bit. Um, yeah. Yes. So capacity building. Um, I don't know if they've have they released the guidelines for that for next year. Yeah. Yeah. So the city also runs a capacity building grant program. I haven't seen the new fiscal year guidelines, but they, they may be up, I'm not sure. But but yeah, that's a grant for that the city runs for like consulting services or you can travel for professional development um, or a few other things to enhance your capacity like as an artist or as an organization. So that program may be different for next year, but there should be some guidelines up about that soon. Foundation Center. Regional Foundation Library? UT Regional, UT Regional Foundation Library. So that could be a good resource. Um, and the core, so community initiatives is uh, more geared towards kind of one-off projects or like, uh, you know, like a small film series or a series of events that's going to happen in kind of a short period of time. Um, the core grant is more geared towards like a year of programming. So like at the Paramount, we apply for core grants for a full year of, for like our full season of all the concerts that are gonna happen. Um, core is also gonna be changing this year. It's kind of in consultation right now, so we don't know what that's gonna look like exactly, but those applications are gonna open up um, in April with a with May 1st deadline, most likely. Um, both of these programs you can apply for through a fiscal sponsor. The community initiatives you can apply for as an individual without a fiscal sponsor, but I don't really know what that looks like. So, um, and then this, this is, I think, this has been pretty useful for me. Um, is uh, reverse engineering grant sources. Um, so for instance, uh, at the Paramount we have arts-based arts education residencies that we run in schools. Um, and so there's an organization in town called MindPop and they do lots of arts-based education work in schools as well. And so I will go to their website and we'll look at their list of uh, all, all their sponsors and donors um, because they do similar work to what I need to get funded. Um, and then I'll go and look through all of these organizations. And then depending on how deep down you wanna go, you can then go look at these organizations and see who they fund. And then look at those organizations, see who funds them. So depending on how much time and patience you have uh, this can take you, you know, as far as you want to go. Um, and then there are grant specialists uh, that will help you find some of these things. So this is this is the list that I put together for this woman that I'm working with on a documentary. Um, so. Something like this is useful if you have a little bit of money to spend and you don't want to spend the time looking through all of these things. Um, someone that does this type of work can put together a list for you that looks kind of like this with some funding sources, uh, deadlines, you know, how long it will take to hear back about the grant, potential awards. Um, and then 
One thing here, uh, so like all of these have websites except for this one. Um, there's lots of family foundations, especially that don't have websites or any sort of public facing internet presence. And the only way to find them is like through GuideStar or through Foundation Center, or just, just sifting through 990s, which is really tedious work, but you know, it's sometimes will turn up some treasure. The 990 is the tax document that uh, nonprofits have to file every year. So it will list, depending on what's made public on the 990, it will list um, like the organizations that they give funds to, uh, how much money they're giving to these organizations, sometimes for what. It will list like who they're the top five folks that they're paying in their organization and how much. Um, it's kind of like a tri transparent financial document that outlines the whole operations of the foundation or the nonprofit or whoever it is. Uh, it completely ranges on the person and the size of the budget of the organization, but anywhere from like forty dollars an hour to one hundred and fifty dollars an hour. Um, Sometimes more or less, depending on who it is. So we should try to become grant specialists. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're right about at 8 o'clock. Um, I'll just show you this real quick. This is my grant calendar at the Paramount. All right. This is this is about this is about a fifth of it. So it's it's kind of chaotic, uh, but I don't know. I think everyone probably does this a little bit differently. But here I have uh, it organized by funding sources on the side and time, um, and then color coded yellow are things that I need to do. Green is uh, you know, applications that I've submitted, read, and stuff that's been declined. But this is, uh, for, for an organization the size of the Paramount, you have, I mean, like I said, this is about 20, 25% of my full list. So it's, you have to like keep up with a lot of things. And there's no way to aggregate. There's no one out there that aggregates all of this. So you just have to go to each of these websites, you know, three or four times a year to check when the new application deadlines are, check when the new report deadlines are. I mean, they don't send you emails when they change things, so you'll miss stuff if you don't check it every once in a while. Um, this is besides that organization, you have to apply to that many grants. Yeah, yeah, so the Paramount is like a $10 million, $10 million a year organization, so my grant budget is like $700,000 a year. Yes. Thank you so much, David.